rapid fire, and I mean rapid fire tour of the global economy and try to highlight some of the predictions that we're making for 2014, hopefully some interesting predictions that you might not have anticipated. Now, we're calling this for the new year one of recovery and risk. So we'll tell you what we mean by recovery and risk. So let's start with the good news and talk about why we think things will be a little bit better. When Jan Hatzius was on earlier, he talked about acceleration. What you're looking at here are the growth rates for the three big, rich, established economies, the United States, the Eurozone, and Japan. Look towards the far right. What you see is this is the first year in the last four or five years that all three of those big, rich economies are growing at the same time. That's one of the reasons why we say there's going to be an acceleration. In 2011, Japan contracted. In 2012 and 13, it was the Eurozone. But this year, for the first time, everybody's up. All three of them are growing. And since the three of those together account for about half of global GDP, it means you get off to a good start for the year for 2014. So that's one good sign to start off with. And the US will do the best of those. The US might actually muster as much as 3% growth next year. Now, on the US, though, interesting point. This recovery is bittersweet for a big reason. Everyone knows that the big issue here is jobs. That's what the Fed's focusing on. That's what President Obama's focusing on. It's on jobs. What you're seeing there is during the period just before the recession, there were 138 million Americans who were working. That dropped to 128 million. And today, six, seven years after the recession was over, we're still not back to where we were in 2007. The good news in a prediction for 2014 is that around June or July of next year, we will finally regain all of the jobs that were lost during the recession. So that's the good news. The bad news is things have moved on since then. A lot more people have entered the labor force. And even by the end of next year, even though all those jobs have come back, so many more people have gone into the labor force that there will still be 11 or 12 million people who want jobs that don't have them. That's why there's all the focus on jobs. So we're making progress, but not nearly as much progress on jobs as we would need to make. But at least it's moving in the right direction. Now, one good thing that will help the US economy, and this is another prediction for 2014, everyone knows that the United States imports a lot of oil. But 2014 will be the first time in 20 years that the United States will actually produce, drill, pull out of the ground in the United States more oil than it imports. That hasn't happened again in 20 years. And that will also help the economy because more energy at lower prices will help manufacturing and help to drive things forward. So if you're looking for a positive story, even though you can talk about whether you like shale gas and shale oil or not, from an economic standpoint, it's a sea change in the way the US powers its economy. So that's going to be a good sign. And another reason why, although 2014 is not by any means going to be a boom, there's going to be some motivation and some acceleration pushing things forward. Now, we've talked about the US. I said we'll do a rapid fire tour. So let's just talk a little bit about the Eurozone. And uh, Josef Ackerman was discussing this earlier. You're looking here at growth rates in the four big economies in the Eurozone. So Germany, France, Italy, and Spain. And you can see there pretty clearly that they had not one recession in the Eurozone, but two. One in 2008 and 9, and another one last year and the first part of this year. But if you look towards the right, you can see that finally, finally, after going through two recessions, the double dip, in 2014, everyone in Europe is going to be growing. Not by much. All those structural issues are there. A lot of the debt is there. Europe, especially around the periphery, the Greeces and the Portugal still have a very long way to go. But Germany is doing quite well. And when Germany does well and some of the other northern countries do well, they pull things up. So again, this is not a big recovery for Europe, but it is a recovery. It means that Europe is no longer below water. You merge that in with the US and with Japan doing a bit better, it does create some of that momentum. Now, put all that together and what do you get? We're looking at those rich countries, and we're going to call them the G4 just for purposes of, of easy identification. So the G4 would be the United States, Japan, the UK, and Germany. And we looked at those against the famous BRIC economies. So you know who the BRICs are, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. So these have been the sort of standard bearers for the emerging markets for the last few years. And if you looked at how much those economies, the four on the rich side and the four on the emerging market side, how much they contributed 
to global growth in any given year. Most of the time, for the last seven or eight years, it's been the BRICs that have been contributing more. They're smaller, but they're growing a lot faster. And in 2013, that was the case. 2014, it won't be. 2014 will be one of those rare years when those four old line economies will actually contribute more to global growth than the BRICs did. Not because the BRICs are necessarily uh, in a big decline, but they are decelerating. They're not booming the way they were five or six years ago. So it's not by much, but you can see that those four rich economies are beginning to come out of that terrible recession and that long lag that lasted after it. Now, a lot of people have started to notice this. You're looking here at stock markets. One is a, a collection of all the stock markets in the rich world. The other one is a collection of all the stock markets in the emerging economies. You can see that until about the beginning of this year, they were pretty much moving in, in parallel. The markets were going up and down in a uniform way in the rich countries and in the developing countries. But look at what happened starting at the beginning of the year. Investors are beginning to make a distinction. They're beginning to see that the recovery is starting in the richer world, and they're beginning to have some doubts about the emerging markets for a variety of reasons, some of which we'll talk about in a moment. But you can see that if you buy the argument that investors sort of put their money where their mouths are, they clearly are beginning to make a decision that the richer countries are looking better, and you can certainly see that here. You can see how well the stock market has done in the U.S. It's up 25 percent this year, not quite that well in Europe, but close to it. So really, investors are beginning to say that there is a bit of a difference here. Now, what's happening in the emerging markets? Why have they slowed down? There are a lot of reasons for that. We won't go into all of them. But one of them is that you have to look at where the capital is flowing. Now, earlier, you heard Jacob Frankel and some of the other panelists talk about central banks. I haven't mentioned central banks yet, but these are a big, big story. What you're looking at there are the balance sheets of three big central banks the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, and the Bank of England. What this basically shows in simple terms is how much money these banks have just been printing, and they have been printing money in overdrive for the last five years to try to get the economy starting. Based on our projections, by the end of next year, and they're still printing money, by the way, the Fed has not stopped printing one dollar of money, even though there's been a lot of talk about this, and the Bank of Japan is printing even more than the Fed is. By the end of next year, these three central banks alone will have added six trillion, not billion, six trillion dollars in money that they have just pushed out into the global economy in the hopes that somebody would lend it and somebody would borrow it and it would start creating some economic activity. Six trillion dollars. As Jacob Frankel mentioned, if you had said that 10 years ago to central bankers, they would have thought we would have been in some horrific inflationary spiral at this point. And if anything, people are worried that there's not enough inflation. So the terms of the debate have changed a lot. But a lot of that money that has been pushed out there for the last four or five years has actually gone into the emerging markets. That's one of the reasons why the emerging markets did so well, because investors couldn't get a return in the rich world because you know where interest rates are. Anybody with a CD here is getting next to zero on it. So a lot of that money that was pushed out has gone into emerging markets. And now, what is the Fed saying? The Fed is saying that they're going to print a little bit less in 2014. And maybe by the end of 2014, they won't be printing any at all. And the mere prospect of the Fed taking even a little bit of money out of the market has really started to cause, at least in the middle of this year it did, a real panic. What you're looking at there is every time someone at the Federal Reserve, usually Ben Bernanke, the chairman, even hinted at the fact that they were going to print a little bit less money, interest rates in the U.S., and what you're looking at there, the blue line at the bottom, is the interest rate on a 10-year bond, the U.S. 10-year Treasury, which is a benchmark for much of the cost of capital in the global economy. And as soon as the Fed started to say, say, we may tighten, we may tighten by just a little bit, the interest rates in the U.S. went up. And as soon as interest rates in the U.S. went up and investors decided they could get a better return here, the money flowed right out of the emerging markets. It isn't often you see things work in an exact mirror image, but that's what happened. And every time the Fed started to talk tough, the, mo the money flowed out of the emerging markets, and whenever the Fed pulled back a little bit, the money flowed back in. For 2014, you're going to see the Fed actually begin to take the first real steps 
towards reducing the amount of money it's putting into the economy. And what that's going to mean is there's going to be some volatility in 2014. We're not expecting, as some people have suggested, that there's going to be a crash. The emerging markets today in 2013 and 14 are not the emerging markets of the 1980s and 1990s. Some of you can probably remember all those emerging market crises. They're in much better shape and they will not go through the kind of meltdown they had 20 years ago. But if you're looking for 2014 for a theme to keep in mind, watch what the Fed says because what the Fed will be doing will impact us here, but it's going to impact the emerging markets even more because the Fed is setting the terms for when money moves in and out of the emerging markets. So one other point to mention. I've been, I think, conspicuous by saying nothing about China so far. You can't talk about the global economy without talking about China. China overall is still doing very well. China's going to grow by 7.5% this year. It'll grow by a little bit less than that next year. This is a big economy still growing at a pretty healthy rate. But we mentioned that there were some risks recovery and risks as well. One of the risks we talked about is that money that could flow out of emerging markets depending on what the Fed does. The other risk is one that doesn't get discussed very often. And that is one of the reasons China has done so well. Part of it is because it's a strong economy. They have richer people who are spending more money. Manufacturers do very well in China. But China has also built up over the last few years a terrific banking bubble. China's banking system doesn't look a lot different than the way the Japanese banking system looked 20 years ago or the way the US banking system looked a decade ago. And what you're seeing here is that the amount of loans that are being pushed out in China has basically tripled over just a few years. And all of that money that's flowing out has caused a lot of manufacturing in areas that China doesn't need, a lot of overcapacity, and just the kind of problems you have when there's too much credit and too much debt building up. So one of the things we're looking at in 2014 is whether the Chinese government will be able to get its arms around this banking bubble and begin to deflate it in a fairly sound fashion. We think that they've already started to do it, and there's some good signs there, but if you're looking for a risk in 2014, it's going to be that the Chinese government does not take the steps it needs to take to deflate that bubble before it pops. We don't expect it to pop, but it's certainly a risk for 2014. So I'm going to wrap up. One last point. So where's the growth? Who are we going to see growing the fastest and doing the best in 2014 if you look at all the regions and all the major economies around the world? This is a snapshot of what's happened over the last two years and what we think is going to happen next year. Two things you can see there. On the left are all the emerging markets. So in spite of the fact that the emerging markets are decelerating a bit, you can still see the richer countries are the ones that are off to the right, the emerging markets are the, to the left. You can still see that there's no question that the fastest growth rates are still occurring in the emerging markets. Even with the struggles they're having, the Chinas, the Indias, and the others are still going to have the fastest growth rates, and the emerging market growth story is by no means over. But if you look to the right, you can begin to see that even though those rich countries are growing slower than the emerging markets, they are picking up that acceleration that Jan Hatzius and Jacob Frankel talked about. It is real. It is happening. It's not a boom, but it is an acceleration. And if you look overall across the years, you'll see that 2014 will be better. We're not back to 2005 or 6. This is not a boom. But if we've had a slow pickup over the last four or five years, the pickup is beginning to build some momentum in 2014. And we think that there is no question that next year will be a better year. Consumers will feel better. Businesses should feel better. And hopefully that momentum will continue into 2015. So thank you very much.